Welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment program in Seattle, Washington. I'm your host, Carter Umhow, a therapist at Opal and an artist and a writer. And I'm joined by the Opal founders, Dr. Lexi Kiplin, Kara Bazzi, Julie Church. The Appetite is all about asking more of life in the realms of food, body, mental health, and relationship. Today, Julie, Kara, and Lexi, the co-founders of Opal, are reflecting on this moment in their lives as business owners and looking back at the women that came before them. In this conversation, we're exploring how we became who we are and how the power of understanding the context of our own lineage, familial and otherwise, can actually bring us in closer toward ourselves. So what did you all want to be when you grew up, when you were kids? Did you have an idea about that? Yes. Yes? I think I wanted to be an attorney. Oh. And I think I got that idea because I was pretty good at arguing and making my case. And my parents would always say, you're going to make a great attorney. And I was like, okay, I want to be an attorney. (laughs) And then switched to pre-medicine and then went to my first psychology class and was Mm -hmm. sold. And I think the medicine was more of a what I think my family would have wanted me to do more. And then I found myself in psychology and said, nope, I'm doing this. Mm. Yeah. Do you see any connection between the like argumentative attorney and the the work you wound up actually doing? It's funny. I don't. (laughs) Utilization reviews. (laughs) Yeah. Oh. (laughs) But I don't find myself to be like very argumentative. So I don't maybe... I don't, I think I have a good, I can make good cases. (laughs) But in a um, calm demeanor that people are like, this seems so reasonable. (laughs) Which is powerful. It is. You would have been a great attorney. You could have. Yeah. 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 (laughs) What about either of you, Julia or Kara? Did you have a sense of kind of what you wanted to be as a kid and where that idea came from? My early one was an astronomer. Oh. I was obsessed with actually stargazing (laughs) and the constellation of Cassiopeia. And then I found out that astronomy was not stargazing. And I was very disappointed. Yeah. I didn't know what a hard science it was, but I just liked looking out at the stars (laughs) and the universe Mm. and I don't know, the vastness. Mm -hmm. I feel like actually that was part of kind of my more creative, non responsible. Mm-hmm. little girl self of just like mm-hmm. laying out and staring at the stars mm-hmm. yeah and then I actually I don't think I knew that you were pre-medicine Lexi because then That's I got path. super herbal yeah I got very responsible in high school and then was pre-medicine for my first three years at college mm-hmm. so I pretty much made it through all the courses and yeah. then I had my epiphany at the end of my junior year and went into the counseling side I did all the pre, almost all the pre med requisites, and then a lot of failed. Wasted, uh, what an interesting well, a lot of connection. To yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I remember that I wanted to be a marine biologist. Mm-hmm. I was very, really into orcas and dolphins. dolphins. Yes, I still actually wish I could live in the sea. To be honest, do you see so, any connection to that interest in what you do now? Well, I think that it was science-based because then in high school, I loved chemistry Mm -hmm. and thought then when I went off to college, I thought I was becoming a chemist. I said this in an earlier podcast and, you know, have create soaps and shampoos and yummy, smelly hygiene products. That's what I thought I'd do. Um, (laughs) So fun. But then, so it was a science thing, I guess. But then nutrition obviously stays in the sciences. It just was a little bit more Mm -hmm. helper. Mm -hmm. But I actually look back sometimes and now I'm in the Northwest and there's all these places that people do pursue education in marine biology. And I thought, oh, I just don't think it was, didn't seem realistic, I don't yeah, think. not a real, like, mm-hmm. well-worn path yet. Yeah. In any way. Yeah. I always wanted to work in a mental institution. Really? <laughs> yeah. Harder. <laughs> I got a lot. Yeah, I know. It's a little ironic. But um, I also wanted to be, like, an undercover reporter. So Ooh. I'd sort of, like, blend but, in and, well, like, write about that. it. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I totally or a singer, see that. Yeah. Or a wow. singer. Or a singer. Like, yeah. you know, country singer or something. <laughs> I know. What a both. combo. I can see country. Both. I don't see country, but maybe. My mom was from the South, so okay. it's, you know, okay. what, we, what we listen to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Were there particular people that you all recognize as, as being kind of influencers, either in what you wanted to do or just how you wanted to be in the world? Well, certainly, I mean, my parents... Um, and and very in different ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, all three of us have dads who were um, 
also business owners. Mm -hmm. So we grew up watching that. And I think that that has had an impact on, I don't know, us opening Opal to some degree that was with us. Probably we felt some confidence because we saw it happening growing up. Mm -hmm. But the person I, I think about outside of my family is Mrs. Yvette Gardner from my fifth, she was my fifth grade teacher and she's still in my life now and is, you know, friends with my, my family and my dad and my dad just saw her a few weeks ago and she really believed in me in a way that had me believing in myself. She just had just saw this, all this potential for me that I don't, I just, and I could just see it in her eyes and I mm. just rose to the occasion and she did, she just followed me through all of my years and has been a family friend since then, but she is, um, was, she's dear to me and had quite an impact on me. Um, in terms of my academics, but even beyond that, she just thought, she always said, you can just do whatever you want. You get to just mm. do whatever you want because you have all these things you could do, you know, that you could just step in and do. And yeah, she just makes me emotional talking about Yvette, mm. Mrs. Gardner. Mm. Mm. Yeah. She's awesome. What a special mm. thing to have someone just kind of open up the possibilities mm -hmm. rather than being, I mean, it's so special to have someone where you look at like, oh, I want to do that. I want to be just like her yeah. but it sounds like mrs gardner was someone that really reflected you back to yourself mm. yeah maybe so and she was she's a she is a really strong woman too i mean she had her own she had a presence and a strength about her mm -hmm. um and she was playful but then i think she had some vulnerability in there i can remember her being really real and authentic she's just a really cool woman and someone i continue to look up to in my life mm. what about either of you <clears throat> well, my heart is beating mm. out of my chest. <laughs> I, oh. My heart's racing a little bit. Um, yeah, it's a funny time to be having this conversation about lineage because I think I've mentioned before in a podcast that we just got done remodeling our house. Mm -hmm. And so we've been having, we've been unpacking boxes and I've been finding boxes um, of memories that I haven't seen since high school. Wow. Um, and have been going through, going through them um, kind of in detail and in intrigue about um, the, just stuff from childhood all the way through college. And I'd, I wouldn't say my memory is amazing when I think of specifics and details. And so going through these memory box, bro boxes, I was bringing up a ton um, and a lot of emotion. And it, so it feels like, like a deeper topic for me in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and... <laughs> But what I what was pretty um, obvious is, I mean, I had a scrap. I had all these scrapbooks and photo albums, and I just saw card after card after card after card from my mom. And as I've said before, here is I, you know, I was a big achiever, and I think a lot of a lot of history of um, just people acknowledging admiration of things I've achieved mm. and my mom I think one of the things I paid attention to and was noticed about her was her focus on relationships and her tending to relationships and the depth of her friendships and she would write notes to her friends and me regularly and they were encouraging notes they were she's a woman of deep faith so she wrote prayers to her friends scripture to her friends encouragement to her friends and same with me and I just remember thinking man if I'm only so lucky to be a friend like that and I think it really influenced then in high school a quality of friendship that I brought to my own friends in response to watching how she loved other people mm -hmm. and so I started developing that just or just really developing my way of loving and um, expressing that love to people and so then I could see in my scrapbooks just you know those types of letters coming to my friends back from my friends and in the midst of being such an achiever I think that was I knew deep down that that's really what mattered was the relationships and the connection and loving people in that way and so I mean I think looking through all that through, through all the other stuff, cutting through all that, like kind of the depth of just um, what it means to tend to people. And I really admired that in my mom. And I think that's really led, it ended up leading me to eventually choosing psychology and choosing to become a therapist. That's such a beautiful way to, to understand you. I think as someone that so clearly is pursuing like risk and, and vulnerability and relationship, 
it's really cool to think about all those letters being there in a box somewhere as part of your your story. Yeah. I can hear a lot of kind of a particular way of being in the world and how to relate. And I'm curious about just how you understood how to be a woman or understood yourself as a woman, both professionally or relationally or kind of yourself in a family and what that felt like. Well, I'm looking at a picture of my my grandma, Evanel, who is, is the embodiment of love. I mean, she was just like truly love all the time and just hugs and somebody who um, in maybe a similar way was very like relationally concerned and, but always put her needs, her needs were not even in the picture. Mm -hmm. And so she was, she was very much at the service of her loved ones. And, um, but she really showed us all a really pure form of love. She was just the sweetest little thing, Mm -hmm. four foot 11 cruising around, hugging people. Mm -hmm. So I think about her, but I also, um, that's on my, on my dad's side, my grandma, on my dad's side, but I've been doing a lot of thinking about what of my family history is with me today and what, what of my past is part of my current story. And the, recently we had a, a flu epidemic in the United States and it made me think of what happened a hundred years ago with the um, flu epidemic of 1918 which the outbreak of the flu epidemic was in Kansas. The initial outbreak was in Kansas, and it was happened to be you know, a few miles from where my um, great-grandmother was living, Lida, was living in uh, Kansas, Clay County, Kansas. And she was 21 years old, and she had just had my grandmother, Irene, six months prior and she died as a result of the flu epidemic of 1918 and she left my grandmother a six-month-old baby and the story of the loss of Lida in my family lives on in me I think as I as I've been going through my own grief and loss experiences I can I've been connecting with what of this is actually my my part of my family story that Mm. I'm carrying with me What's, and I've been thinking a lot about what's my relationship to grief and connecting it to what happened to Lida and, and my, my dear grandmother, Irene, who lost her mom at, at six months old. And then as a result of that, my grandmother, Irene, didn't, you know, she didn't have a mom. Mm-hmm. And her, her dad was a farmer and was out on the farm. So she, she didn't have a strong maternal figure, figure in her life as she, as she grew up. So she was never mothered herself. And then she married my my grandpa and Grandma Tilly came into the scene and was really a powerful force um, in my family. It was just a very, um, everyone just adored her. And she was, was very Tilly? lovely. So that was my dad, my grandpa's gr- mom. Okay. So when they got oh, married, my mom, mom got a mom. Cool. Mm-hmm. And then because I think my grandmother wasn't mother, didn't have a mother, she didn't know how to mother her three sons in the same way you do when you live and breathe the experience of being mothered. Right. Right. So then the impact of her lack of mothering impacted my, my mom and her brothers. I think, Mm. I think my mom would speak to that. And then the impact of um, my grandmother having the loss of her grandmother on my mom um, was felt by me, what Mm. affected my mother and, and affected probably her parenting of me, and I carry that with me today. I can feel, I can feel the loss of Lida, mm. you know, a hundred years ago, in my life, in my life now, and I can see the story arc of the loss and how it, how it's moved through the generations, mm. and how I think about what that will mean for uh, my daughter, you know, who I hope we're moving out of that story arc of of yeah. loss mm. and into a different way of being as a mother daughter yeah. so yeah a hundred years ago mm-hmm. um my family was impacted and i just feel you know i could feel connected to my grandmother being six months old and losing her mom and mm. trying to manage her life from there so it's such an interesting and important thing to think about kind of the generations before us and i think that When, as a therapist, I imagine talking to people about kind of understanding their lineage, 
normally it feels like people typically talk about kind of the generation just before them. And it's sometimes pretty hard to understand the emotional experience of that generation and then the generation before. But this feels like such a beautiful example of something big, some huge event happening in Mm -hmm. a distant relative's experience and and that just so obviously trickling down in these ways that mm-hmm. that it sounds like you've explored and sought out and yet also maybe seem somewhat apparent mm-hmm. at the same time. Yeah, I mean it's just been a big part of my growing up because mm-hmm. when Tilly when Tilly came onto the scene and was a mother to my mom and grandma, you know, the whole family just seemed to be soaking her up and then wow. she died in in 1958 and I think my mom was 9. And so the loss of Grandma Tilly, so there was, you know, the loss of this mother figure who swooped in. So Grandma Tilly, I've heard about, you know, all through my life about how dear Grandma Tilly was and how, you know, there was life before Grandma Tilly and then there was life after Grandma wow. Tilly and two very different experiences for um, from, from my family, for my, my mom will talk about it. It's just a profound loss for the family. And she died at more natural age. Yeah, right? she she right? died. She was born in eighteen eighty three and died in nineteen fifty eight. Of I think she died of ovarian cancer in Broughton, Kansas. You spoke mm-hmm. a little bit to um, to how you imagine yourself as a mother at this point, but are there any specifics around kind of how you how you have heard about Tilly, for instance, and mm-hmm. how you take on kind of that role as mother based mm-hmm. off of what you've heard? Yeah, it's funny as as you asked that question, I could feel the tears welling in my eyes mm. because I do think of I've heard so much about Tilly. I've I've heard about Tilly, you know, yeah. as in I've really understood that her impact was profound on many lives and she was apparently very, you know, generous and kind and you know, she's just all the things you would want a mother to be kind of person, very much idealized. Mm-hmm. Um so I always wonder what's a real Tilly, <laughs> but um, the idolization of her is incredible. Wow. Um, just this embodied love, you know. So I have a lot of people I look to in my life for guidance about how to be a mom, including my own mom, Grandma Tilly, and um, my grandma Irene. My grandma Irene, uh, even Ellen Irene, both of them. Mm. I have a lot of folks I look to, and I have a bonus mom. A bonus mom. Yeah, Joey, <laughs> who's also just a wonderful um, mother figure for me, too. Don't know where I'd be without all of those women. I certainly wouldn't be here. Wow. And I think of also, I'm, I know I'm going. <laughs> no going back. So now I think of, so I, I told you about um, Yvette Gardner, right. my fifth grade teacher. And then I also think about um, Dr. Mary Lee Nelson, who was um, one of my, was on my chair, was my chair of my graduate committee, and she was incredible to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, just open doors, kind, just was believed in me. And then after graduate school, I had Dr. Beth Kerr and Dr. Laura Little, who opened, who said, we believe you should be a lecturer at the U- university. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then I did it. And, wow. you know, I think, I can think of all these women that without them, I just truly, I don't know where I would be, you know, in terms of guides and people believing in me when I wasn't believing in myself. I hope to pass that on in my life to others. Mm. Julie, is there anyone in particular for you kind of within your lineage or maybe the story of of some of your family that that feels like it's deeply influenced you? Mm. Yeah, I, I do especially connect with thinking about some images and stories related to my granny. So this is my mm-hmm. maternal grandmother, mm-hmm. I call her granny. And as I've kind of think about these little images or these little stories, it, it definitely pulls in things related to my mom to have like, oh yeah, that came from, you know, both and. But I think it starts from hearing about stories of grandmother who was granny's mother who lived in Ohio and that's where my granny was raised. And when my mom and her siblings would go down to Ohio to, to be with grandmother, it was like one week every summer, it sounded like. And the stories that come out of that time were just always sounds like it was a great tradition and wonderful time together there. But grandmother had a very um, strict household <laughs> is oh. what I also hear is like you do things at grandmother's house a certain way. <laughs> yeah, but it's also kind of funny to hear about teenage years they got around that <laughs> but anyways then I my granny though um, was in her adult life in Wisconsin and that's where she raised my my mother um, with my gramps 
and her name is Pauline Petty. And some of the images, first image that I always thought of was getting to go to the office where she worked with this typewriter. So old classic typewriter on this desk. And it felt like this really bare office space. And this is my memory, right? So definitely like black and white in my mind, right? Mm -hmm. But like grayish, lots of metal. (laughs) Um, But I remember getting to see that and kind of, I think there's something in that of recognizing, oh, okay, my... My granny, she works like she has a place that she goes and she has people lean into her and like need her in in what they're doing. And that was um, she was secretary and receptionist at a economy forum was place. They did cement production of some cement things used in construction. (laughs) So she was supporting the salesperson of that. Right. So she had a secretarial supportive role. I I remember thinking she she got she got some stuff done when she was there in the (laughs) office (laughs) and it always felt the same way when I was with her at her home as well. And uh, especially there was one week every year that we would always spend there while my parents got their time away from the kids Mm -hmm. and especially that time. But otherwise as well, because I did live in the same city. So we would see them for you know regular times. But the things that I would say is that she was uh, she was always getting things done <laughs> and keeping busy. And I I remember for a, for a good cause, that, that also, like she she always was volunteering at a place that kind of like a goodwill, a place that gathered, you know, had took donations and then made money for a good cause. And then she was, one of the things when we would sit and watch TV, we would take, there was this little bucket of stamps that were cut out of envelopes and we would then soak them And then take the stamps off gently because you could get something back for the stamp. Again, it's like very, very minimal amount of money per stamp. But all of that then to go to a good cause. And then I think of all of her volunteer efforts. At When I was in high school, she got the award as like the volunteer of the year at my high school. I was mm-hmm. I had pride. It actually feels like the studio in here. There was this one place where the volunteers would come, and there was a glass window f- that went into the cafeteria in high school, and there was a blind. So kind of like we're seeing Daniel in the production room here at the studio, <laughs> but there was a blind, so we couldn't see that. But I remember in the senior cafeteria lounge, you could like knock on the glass window when I would know Granny was there oh. <laughs> volunteering and doing whatever. I think a lot of the stuff she did on was related to, well, she was, yeah, she was the president of the guild, the ladies guild with, for the high school. and But she was stuffing things and organizing pamphlets and papers and things in there. I, I don't know what she was doing, but <laughs> she was just always volunteering. So I think that I, um, and she was a knitter or a crocheter. <laughs> I don't actually cool. know, but I do have her instruments N- needles because needles? Needles. <laughs> <laughs> I was like oh I want those like when I when we were going through her things after she passed so I yeah I think of qualities around her and how that trickled down to my own mother and and to me just this yeah kind of doer go-getter and really networked and connected I can see that in my mom also how that trickled down just really social and and good relationships and how that then led to yeah, purpose and making meaningful impact. Mm. Uh, and again, I have more of a retroactive thought around that. Like I wasn't necessarily watching her thinking, yeah, mm-hmm. I want to be like her. But now I I, I find pride. Mm-hmm. Like I feel I find deep pride in finding the ways, right, yeah. that I am her, like mm-hmm. that those, those qualities. Um, and feeling, yeah, grateful, I guess, that I come from strong women that um, I don't know if my household is like grandmothers, but <laughs> maybe. I mean, I think my kids know that it, things that, that I like and I don't like, but <laughs> what they're supposed to do and when they're not supposed to do. I just don't think they actually obey me and like do the right things, but they I might, think they well, know. Yeah, they'll probably remember mm. later. Yeah, I think they know. Um, <laughs> anyways, so I, I do. I, yeah, I think I have a couple other images, but yeah. those, yeah, that industrious kind of doer mm-hmm. Um, for good purpose feels like mm, I didn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> I came from these women, you know. Mm. From, yeah. Kara, what about you? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm laughing hearing about Julie talk about Granny because um, I relate a lot with my own grandmother, Ruth, who's my mom's mom. And she is Norwegian, very proud Norwegian, c- comes from Minnesota, uh, very industrious and really strong in her her, her Lutheran community. And she was also a trailblazer because she, um, I just remember her always kind of bragging about (laughs) how she was, 
she was a nurse. She worked full time and she was a nurse. And she basically always would tell us that she was doing what the doctors were doing without the doctor title. <laughs> and, and and with, I mean, a lot of bragging about it um, and just proud of herself because she was really confident and self-assured. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes me think of lineage in terms of like kind of more gender, um, kind of the uh, gender traits and she had, I think, more of some of the masculine traits. She was really assertive, dr highly driven. And I think, you know, it's interesting because my grandpa, Emerald, was kind of more of the soft, more soft and, and expressed maybe more of the softer emotions. And I think my mom, you know, had feelings kind of as the child of those two parents. But I think she really admired her mom. And then I think she, my mom, could see those traits in me of having some of both the masculine and femi feminine traits. And, you know, I, I think, um, and that's where I, I kind of see sort of the lineage of, of, of ways that I, am, I embrace some of my mom's um, characteristics, but also really taking some of that drive and I can do whatever I want mentality that my grandma definitely held. I don't know mm. if I'm as industrious <laughs> as my <She> grandma was. <laughs> I mean, or doing as much. Actually, I think of like the hospitality of my grandma and mm. that's, I mean, I don't, I don't share the same hospitality <laughs> traits, but she would, you know, she would like bake a ton for her, you know, for every like. You make a good cookie. I do make a good cookie. <laughs> that is true. But she would make like 500, right, yeah. for her church. <laughs> right, and make money off of them. Yeah. Well, or not, yeah, or... she just would give. I mean, she yeah. was very generous. It was very yeah. shown in acts of service mm. is what I would say, right? Like, whereas I'm I'm going to give more emotionally probably to people. And her, she just made a tons of crumb caca left. <laughs> uh, um, she was also a crocheter. She played all her games with people and um, very, very, very social, totally extroverted. So I did not take the extroverted gene. And then my dad's mom died before I was born. So I never got to meet her. I never had the privilege of meeting her. Um, apparently, that's where I get my, um, they always told me that that's where I get my 5'10", you know, my frame, height. my height from my grandma, Hilda May. And that's my middle name is for after her. But then my grandpa married someone um, before I was born. And so she was, she's been my step grandma and she's, she's such a neat lady. She's still alive, Dora, <laughs> Grandy Dora. And she, I would say she has a more of an, like more of an impact on me now. She's um, just the vitality she holds. She still plays pool like three days a week and that's her, wow. her movement and sport. And she's got some nice sass and attitude about what she can do on the pool table. Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah, it's awesome. I brought her into just conversations in our rethinking sport group of like, what a neat example of somebody who's still living life to the fullest and finding ways to, yeah, find sport and movement at um, you know, at an older body age. In that way. Yeah. Does she yeah. go to the bars? I know. You I'm know she. Where it's I think happening. there's. I don't it's think cool. it's actually in bars. Community I think they center? have community. They do it oh. in community oh, centers. Yeah. Um, I was imagining like she's in tournaments there. for pool. It's pretty awesome. That's very amazing. And she she had an RV that I, until recently and was going around the country. She just has a really big sense of adventure, and so she's inspired me in that way. Mm. Even though she's not my blood relative, but mm -hmm. I love her a lot. It's really cool to hear all these different stories mm. and knowing each of you, I can infer a lot mm. of like meaning out of the details. I think more than maybe even a listener would, but. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm aware too of of this conversation. Of course, like bringing up so much loss and so much pain. I feel like there's been like little kind of a bit of a step into that area when each of you have spoken. But I'm aware that like when we were talking about all of this, I was thinking of the genogram, mm -hmm. and I think Kara, you'll probably do a better job at articulating this as a marriage and family therapist. Um, but it is kind of more of a mapping out of a family tree as a therapeutic tool mm -hmm. for that be kind of the way to put it. Yeah, it, it comes it. from yeah, Bowen family okay. systems. But yeah, it's it's where you're 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 tracking. I mean, yeah, I was I've been thinking of it too. Yeah. It's it's different than a family tree in the sense of all the things that you're kind of tracking with a genogram to look for patterns as it relates to, you know, just different things that right. you, that you can you can go with it. But yeah. I was yeah. thinking of it because, you know, I, I am familiar with it as a tracker of maybe like different patterns of divorce or, mm -hmm. or patterns of estrangement or patterns of chemical dependency and exactly. all these things that sound actually kind of more on the negative side than the, oh my God, I was so influenced by my grandmother kind of side of things. <laughs> but the unawareness and a build and actively building an awareness of kind of both the light and the dark of that 
that kind of family history for each person I think is really significant both to understand like, oh, I think I just naturally inherited some of these qualities because I was witnessing them or because they're in my DNA or something like that. But also to be able to really understand both how to embrace ourselves more and also how to forgive ourselves, I think, a little bit more too, that you can really give yourself a lot more grace when you understand, oh, every single person in my position for the three generations before me had a difficult time with this problem. (laughs) And here I am again, holding the weight of that problem as well. And I have a new opportunity to kind of write the write the story or rewrite the story, kind of as you were talking about, Lexi, with mm-hmm. motherhood. Mm-hmm. Um, it's such a beautiful thing. And I think that I wanted to highlight that for for people that might be listening and feeling a lot of pain around, I don't have a very positive mm-hmm. association with thinking about my, my lineage or the lack of different relationships in my life is mm-hmm. painful. Mm-hmm. But, but holding some sort of awareness of, okay, this is what it's been. This is why it matters to look at it, I think, is to really both be able to appreciate some of our own qualities and say, oh, yeah, this is me. That's me. Um, And also kind of both embrace that and let ourselves off the hook a little bit too. Yeah, Yeah, the genogram can be such a powerful tool in terms of even kind of the visual of seeing patterns over generations. And because a lot of times when people do that genogram work, they they aren't aware of that. And so- it does kind of bring that into the conscious and then there's the opportunity to try to break some intergenerational patterns. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. We actually have a client doing it right now at Opal and it's the family therapist has been talking about what an impact it's made of things that this client is, is understanding. Mm. Mm. So it's shifting a little bit away from that, even though I'm really very much want to plug the genogram for people. Um, But I'm curious just sort of as sort of a final topic and question how you all each see your lineage or these stories as relating to your creation of Opal and your career paths in particular. One of the things I want to say before answering that question is that in front of us, on the tables in front of us, are some of the photos of some of the people we've been talking about. Um, And I just would say that one of the reasons we even thought about doing this was because I I thought it would be a beautiful display um, at Opal on the walls to have Mm. one place that we had pictures of the people that have gone before us and have and uh, kind of brought us to this place. So I've been working on this little project on the side of like getting them to have them fa- their family members send me, th- you know, get these yeah. um, photos and hopefully there'll be a, a fun display of some of these photos of the people that have brought us here in the walls at Opal. I just would think about, yes, it does for us feel like it connects to where we've come and mm-hmm. what we have created in Opal and want to have a way that we can show people that walk through there that they don't they've they've come from somewhere too and like a reminder Mm -hmm. to respect their elders and to pause perhaps and and give honor to them so but that didn't answer your question well it sort of does in a way I mean it doesn't you're right but (laughs) it it kind of does this in the sense of of thinking about like uh, just carrying these people with you still and how they do feel so obviously a part of the space for you, yeah. part of that mm-hmm. building. And, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And I, the only other thing I would say is I think all the character traits that I mentioned about my mom and my granny, those things are things I do believe that I I have put into play to make Opal happen and do every day. And even in the ways that sometimes have kind of come to realize, oh, wow, that is it's a strong personality trait in me and it gets stuff done, but it also can interfere with this and this, you know, I can recognize in that, in that path of going, Hmm, I wonder, like, I wonder mm-hmm. what that meant generations before me and all of that, but also having some of that, yeah, grace and pride, right? Yeah. Of like, Ooh, yeah, there I am again. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I see that showing up for sure. Mm, I like that. What about for either of you? Well, I, um, I just, it just feels, um, no, oh, it just connects me with my gratitude for, my ancestors and the women in my life that have um, influenced me. And I think about the story of my grandmother's death, my great grandmother's death in 1918 and the impact that had on my likely particular interest in human suffering Hmm. um, and how that probably guided me to psychology and, and trying to make sense of human suffering and loss 
as and then therefore you know if you keep going with that of course you land with psychology in in opal mm -hmm. so i think when i think about it's you know obviously a really sad experience in my family but if i uh, and I and I do feel the sadness of it, and I feel the gratitude of it too. Could I? I guess I can see how it's, it is part of who I am, mm -hmm. and part of my story, and have respect for it in that way, and how it's impacted my decisions um, with Opal and and beyond. And it may be, you know, maybe hopefully it's helping because of that of what happened in my family. I'm more um, I'm interested in helping others because of the loss that my fam mm -hmm. that I carry. The, the loss that I carry, my family's loss that I carry. Right. Mm -hmm. Kara, how do you see yourself in this? I think what comes to mind for me is, you know, the kind of the double-edged sword of these traits. So the, the drive and the achievement and the productivity and the kind of those qualities that I would say were exhibited in my grandma, my dad. Um, I mean, I do think I got to a place of too much of a good thing and developed an eating disorder. <laughs> I mean, not that that was the only piece of it, but mm -hmm. I think that part of my kind of wiring and what also was praised by a lot of people took me down that path. Mm -hmm. And then I think why, I mean, part of the reason I feel so emotional thinking about all these letters from my mom is that I could see through, through all that, I saw something beautiful in yeah. what she was doing and which is what was, what happened where I had my epiphany in, um, I was planning to be a doctor cause that would have followed all the achieving thing. Right. It was what my dad was hoping for me. And, and then that was when I took that trip to Israel. And when I was in Israel is, is where I was connecting more to the qualities that um, felt more coming from my soul um, and from my mom. And she was a therapist. She's a therapist, um, retired now at this point, but I had never considered becoming a therapist, which is odd. But I think it was, it was so, my, I think there was such a drive to kind of be the most prestigious career. So anyways, I, I think that experience kind of the combination of, of going into psych psychology and then developing my eating disorder were two little prongs that led me into mm. eating disorder work in psychology right. <laughs> and really then eventually, you know, getting to meet these wonderful women that led to <laughs> uh, Lexi and Julie that led to doing something bigger. And then, and then my drive and achievement was beneficial mm -hmm. to opening Opal. Then I could, then I could mediate and I could make some more sense out of those the feminine and masculine qualities that that didn't kind of disavow the other. Your, the influence of your mom and your relationships is so obvious and mm -hmm. clear to me. You know, I know. I mean, she yeah. really taught you. She did how to how to be in relationship beautifully. Kara, you're so you are just uh, yes. I can imagine you writing before the before <laughs> the days of text and <laughs> yeah, emails. You would be writing little notes to us. Yeah. <laughs> Just like yeah. your mom did. Yeah. I don't know if anyone has memory boxes or things that they've saved, but what a gift to pause to look through some of that stuff. Because yeah. it's when our, in our day to days that are so busy, it's hard to create space to even reflect on history and reflect on where we've come from. And anyways, it, it's been in, it's been intense to look through all this stuff and painful and wonderful. So I if there's space in your life to to do some of that mm -hmm. contemplation, I would encourage it. Mm -hmm. There's something in me too. It feels like you're not alone. Like mm -hmm. when we, when we get to do this and I think there's something I want for people to feel that. And, um, even for clients that come into Opal to be able to look and see like, Oh, I could be a part of this. Like, cause I do feel like when clients come to Opal, being able to be impacted by the treatment there, I, I see that as a part of my lineage. Like I see that as a part of who we are then impacting and who I can look back and think have impacted me and so I yeah I think there's a deep I think it can address that loneliness piece of oh mm -hmm. what am I a part of that it, so many people want yeah and I'm you know I've been in this search for meaning place in my life or kind of revisiting m meaning in my life and it's it's powerful to take a look at you know, have this conversation mm -hmm. and think about what of what mattered to me about these women mm -hmm. and does that can how can that inform what matters to me as a person mm -hmm. yeah um it's instructive to because what I value likely is highlighted in their values and their meaning. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that particularly with that question I started with too, just even around like, what were you drawn to as a kid? Mm -hmm. Not just who, but both. I mean, for people that, that might easily be able to think about family members that were so significant, but also just what are the little memories or the little, mm -hmm. what's your own trail, whether that be generations back 
or just in your own your, life, your own diary from third grade? Is there information there about about how you saw the world and and what you were drawn to and who you wanted to be that is maybe really informative of of where you could be headed in your life or who you already are at this point too? It's a really beautiful thing to be able to kind of look back if you can. I always, I also think of the the little ways that we can remember. Uh, too. So I think of pussy willows as a plant that was growing in the back of my granny's house. And so each year we would get to cut some and then save them. And that's something that I love having around because it does remind Mm -hmm. me of her. And I remember even as we were forming and creating Opal Space that one of the first things I did was Mm. get get pussy willows from the local farmer's market. And they were in Mm. my office for the first number of years. They're at my house now, that same bunch. But that is, I I didn't, honestly, I'm not sure I thought, like, I'm going to get these and put these in here so that (laughs) granny's with me. No, I didn't do that. Like, (laughs) it just happened. And I can look back now and go, that's that they mean something to me because of that. And the the bell that we have at the front desk at Opal is my um, great grandfather, Edward's bell that he had when he was the administrator at a school district. So I remember bringing, taking that from my house and going, this is a part Mm -hmm. of my family and wanting that to connect up with Opal. Thank you so much to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering, to Aaron Davidson for the Appetites music, and to Sarah Taylor for production assistance and editing. You can subscribe to The Appetite on your favorite podcast app to automatically download our next episodes and to stay in touch. If you want to learn more about Opal, you can check us out at opalfoodandbody.com or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.